This morning's scripture reading is found in Romans chapter 12, verses 9 through 21. Again, that's Romans chapter 12, verses 9 through 21. Let us hear the word of the Lord. Let love be genuine. Abhor what is evil. Hold fast to what is good. Love one another with brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Do not be slothful in zeal. Be fervent in spirit. Serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in tribulation. Be constant in prayer. Contribute to the needs of the saints and seek to show hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Never be wise in your own sight. Repay no one evil for evil. Give thought to do what is honorable in the sight of all. If possible, so far as it depends on you. Pays the Lord. To the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. For by so doing, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Taylor. Well, good morning. Happy Labor Day weekend. I'm alone, and it is great to be back with you. I was in Wisconsin last week seeing family, and we had a terrific, terrific time. Um, but it's good to be back. Well, we're at the point of the service where we are going to take a look at God's Word. Uh, because we do believe the Bible is God's Word, and we believe that it is authoritative in teaching us how to live, how to think, what to value, and so forth. And so we're going to take a look at it and try to understand it and try to understand how it applies uh, to our lives today. In 1992, the city of Los Angeles pretty much burned itself down. Who here remembers that? Here's what happened. The March before that, March 1991, a man named Rodney King was pulled over for drunk driving after taking the police on a high-speed chase through the city of Los Angeles. When he was stopped, he was pulled out of his car, and there were four police officers who were there. And those four police officers proceeded to beat him with their batons. And it was caught on video. Now this is the day before days before social media, really the internet was in its infancy, but despite that through the miracle of television, that video went in those days, there was not a person in the country who had not seen that video. What happened in 1992 is that those four police officers were put on trial for excessive use of force. None of them were convicted. After the trial, the city of Los Angeles blew up in riots. Really, that put the riots of today to shame. In eight days, over 2,300 people were injured. 63 people were killed. Rodney King was absolutely against the violence. And he gave an impassioned speech asking for the violence to stop. And in that speech, there was a line that he repeated about three or four times that became a part of our pop culture vocabulary. And actually, you still hear it today. It was the line, why can't we just get along. 
That's a good question. I think if Rodney King were alive today, he died in 2012, I think he would pull out that speech, dust it off, give it again, and ask the exact same question. Why can't we all just get along? And we need to ask that question of our nation. We need to ask that question in our cities, in our neighborhoods, in our churches, and in our families. Why can't we just get along? And as we continue in Romans, Romans is going to answer that question in today's passage. Well, let's remind ourselves of where we have been in the book of Romans. Chapter 12 starts the second major part of the book of Romans. And, and Paul has been talking about the nature, true nature of righteousness up to this point. It's a gift of God. And if you understand how broken and sinful we are and how completely dependent we are on God's grace... It forces us to live differently. And now starting in chapter 12, he's going to outline what it means to live differently. We saw in the first two verses of Romans 12 that living differently means living as a transformed people. People that are not shaped by a broken world that that Jordan just talked about. Then last week in verses 3 through 8, Slade took us through the fact that that if we are going to live differently, live in light of the gospel, we must live together as an interdependent body. And there is no room whatsoever for arrogance, for looking down on others, for saying, I don't need you, or for even saying, I'm not needed myself. We are an interdependent body. And now picking up in chapter 9, or in verse 9, what Paul is going to talk about is what must be true if we're going to live as that interdependent body. And here's how he's going to develop it. He's going to introduce us to what genuine love really is, and then he's going to show us in two parts how genuine love actually functions. And the first part he's going to show us is how genuine love clings to what is good. And the second thing he is going to show us is how genuine love overcomes evil. After we look at the passage, I want to pull out one particular principle from that passage and then give you a tool that you can use for this principle or really any time you study the Bible for applying it to your daily lives and into your daily relationships. Now, one of the challenges of this passage, as Taylor read it, that you will notice is that this is like a whole bunch of bullet points. And so it could be It's actually a very easy sermon to write. It's a very hard sermon to give because you're just going through bullet points. So what I'm going to try to do is organize this in a way that that is helpful, the way that sort of helps us grasp what Paul is saying in all of these bullet points. But we're going to start with verse 9 where he introduces us to genuine love. And he says, let love be genuine. Well, what that is talking about is love needs to be without hypocrisy. It's, it's love that is in its purest form, that is sin- sincere. And then he tells us two things that make love sincere, pure, genuine. And the first is what it hates. It abhors evil. It abhors what is against the character of God. This word abhor is an extremely strong, intense word. It's, it's, it's the word that you would use for, for repulsion. If you're driving down the road and you pass a dead skunk, that response inside is what this word is talking about. Here's what you don't do when you pass a dead skunk. I hope. If you do, let's talk later. No, don't. Um, What you don't do is you don't stop the car, pull over and say, let's go examine that. And then say, wow, let's take this home. And let's make this the centerpiece of our dining room table. And when people come over and question why we have a dead skunk as a centerpiece, we justify it. We explain it. We're proud of it. 
You don't do that with dead skunks. Please tell me you don't do that with dead skunks. But we do it with evil. And what verse 9 is saying is that genuine, pure, sincere love looks at that which is against God's character and responds to it like a dead skunk. The word hold fast is an equally strong word. It's the word to cling to something. It's a word to treasure something, to be devoted to someone. It's, it's to look at someone that you are so close to and say, I always have your back. I will always be supportive of you. I will hold tight to you and hold tight to this relationship. And Paul is saying genuine, sincere, pure love. Hates is repulsed by what is evil, but it treasures what reflects the character of God. Our love for one another is genuine to the degree that we do not tolerate evil and we treasure good and righteousness and truth in our relationships. Now, it's tempting when you look at verse 9 to to just kind of put those things out there. Right, to say, yeah, I, I'm repulsed by what is evil. I, I, I hate things like racism, and I hate things like injustice, and I hate things like mushrooms. And, and, and to say, you know, I, I treasure what is good. You know, I, I treasure um, healthy, godly families, and I, I treasure compassion, and I treasure justice, and I treasure apple pie. And, and, it, and it's, it's just really easy to, to kind of look at things out in, in this vague, out there sort of terms, but... But understand that that's not what Paul is talking about. Paul's point is that we need to look at ourselves. Are you repulsed by your pride? Are you repulsed when you participate in gossip? Are you repulsed by your self-centeredness? Do you treasure, pursue, cling to, desire, humility, compassion, Sacrificial support for others. Why can't we all just get along? Because we don't pursue genuine love. We don't hate what is evil. We don't treasure what is good. Now the rest of this passage goes into a whole bunch of bullet points for how you put this into action. And in verses 10 through 16, the focus is on how genuine love clings to, treasures what is good. And I'm going to try to organize these whole bunch of bullet points into five groups. Genuine love clings to what is good by being eager to love one another. Love one another with brotherly affection is a way of saying be devoted to one another as if you are family members. This is a really interesting statement. Outdo one another in showing honor. This is the idea of taking the lead. Doing more than what would ever be expected. And building up one another especially behind each other's backs. See, sometimes what we do is say, this person hasn't done anything for me. This person hasn't supported me. This person hasn't spoken well of me. So I'm not going to say anything to support them. And what this passage is saying is, you take the lead. You take the lead. Because you are so eager to love one another as family. And so the flip side of that is you can't be lazy in your excitement, in your intensity for showing affection, devotion, and honoring one another. Be fervent in spirit. Is, is This word fervent is literally the idea of being on fire, bubbling over, ready to explode in the very core of who you are with the desire to honor, encourage, support, and love one another. And this is your service to the Lord. We talk about I want to be serious about serving God. I want to be serious about serving the Lord. And Paul would say, here's where you start. You start with how you love and honor one another. And if you don't love and honor one another, it's really hard to envision you saying that you serve the Lord. 
The first way that genuine love clings to what is good is to be eager to love one another. The second way is to live in hope. And verse 12 is realistic that we do live in a world where we have crisis, we have tribulation. But we respond to that not in despair, but in rejoicing. And why do we rejoice? Because our hope is grounded in the love and faithfulness of our Heavenly Father. And because we know that he is on our side and that he is working in us and through us and for us, it allows us to be patient in tribulation and it drives us to constantly go before the Lord in prayer. Why would Paul bring up living in hope in the context of love? Here's why. If you're in crisis... You're going to look to something to be your hope. And you're either going to look to the Heavenly Father who loves you, and you're going to say, I trust what you're doing in my life, and my hope is grounded in that. Or you're going to look at the people around you and say, my hope is in you. And so I'm going to use you and manipulate you to get me through this situation. And if you find your hope in other people, you will never, ever be able to truly love them with a genuine love. Genuine love clings to what is good by caring for the weakest. Contribute to the needs of the saints. This is not just about giving money to other Christians who are in need. This is about looking around and saying, what are their needs and how do I meet those needs? Right, So it's more than just money. It might be, in, and, and I'm so pleased with so many who have done this, that, that you, you walk into a situation where you say, I'm, I'm going to be around a bunch of people who are high risk. And so I'm going to put on my mask. I, don't, I hate wearing masks, but I'm going to put it on because I'm around people who are at high risks. That's contributing to the needs of the saints. Show hospitality. Okay, this is dangerous. I might get myself in trouble here. You're, you really should, should ask someone permission before you use them as an example. So, B. Hamilton, can I use you as an example? Great, thank you. Um, B. Hamilton is someone who is just uniquely gifted at bringing you into her home and making you feel welcome. Right? Is just uniquely gifted. And, and when we see this word of show, show hospitality, that's what we think of. And that is an example of hospitality. But what you need to understand is in that culture, it's going beyond even that. It is referring to how strangers, travelers, were treated. Right? A traveler comes through town, and, and in those days, they didn't have a Yeti cooler with them. They, they, they needed some source of food, something to drink, a safe place to stay. And so hospitality meant that you would do what D. Hamilton, B. Hamilton does so beautifully with an absolute stranger that you will probably never see again. You treat them as family. It's meeting the needs of someone you don't know. One of the worst experiences I ever had in a church was in a church in Dallas. I walked in. I'm standing in front of my seat. It's before the service. And there's a guy standing next to me who I will later find out was an elder in the church. And I say hi. He says hi. He asks the question. doesn't ask my name. doesn't give his name. He asks the question, are you new here? Yes, my first time here. And he turns his back to me and talks to what I found out was another elder who was sitting behind him the entire rest of the time about a fishing trip. Did not talk to me the rest of the morning. I was a stranger and he treated me like a stranger. A very different experience at a church I went to in Houston. Only went there one time. Ann and I went along with, uh, for those of you who know, Luke and Alicia Kimbley. We were all together. We walk into this church. Again, we're 
in our row of the four of us together, and there is an elderly couple sitting in front of us. And they turn and introduce themselves, say, are you new here? Yes, we are. We're actually just traveling through. We're heading back to Longview, Texas before too long. They said, you know, usually we would ask you to come join us for lunch, our treat, but we have a meeting that we have to go to after church today, so we can't do that. But will you be in town long enough that we could treat you to lunch another day? They knew we were leaving town and we're not going to come back. But they weren't motivated by, let's try to get them into the church. All that motivated them was, they are strangers, let's treat them as family. That's what Paul is talking about here. That's what genuine love does to cling to what is good. Genuine love clings to what is good by responding to opposition with a blessing. Notice the word bless is used twice. He's trying to emphasize it. And the word bless means to go before God and ask for his favor on behalf of someone else. To ask God to be good to someone that you're praying for. And who is it that you're going to God and asking for him to be favorable to? It is for people who oppose you. Probably referring to people outside of the church, but it applies just as much to people who are inside of the church. You see, love clings to good by asking God to be good to those who oppose you. Finally, love clings to what is good by uniting in humility. He talks about two very different extremes of emotions in this passage in, in, in verse 15. There are those who are joyful and their joy is evident. And there are people who are in a really tough time and their grief is evident. And what Paul says here. As we enter into their lives, we unite with them by stepping into their situation. And, and the fact is, you may be at a point where you're having the best day of your life, but you're with someone who is having the worst day of their lives. And you have to step outside of yourself enough to say, I will be with this person in their grief. Or it might be the other way around. You're having the worst day of your life. And someone has just received wonderful news and you're not feeling it inside. But what you've got to do is step outside of that grief and enter into their joy. Live in harmony with one another. In the Greek, it's literally to use your planning skills to think about how to be at peace with one another. It's thinking about planning. Do not be haughty has the same idea. It's using your planning skills, your thinking about how to elevate yourself. But instead of trying to elevate yourself, you should be willing to be friends with absolutely anybody, even if they cannot contribute to elevating yourself. And part of that means never considering yourself the brightest person in the room. So if that's how you think about yourself, you're not going to think that you need anyone else, and you're not going to be able to live in harmony with, one new else, with anyone else. So what does genuine love do? It holds tight to what is good and is devoted to it. How does it do it? It does that by seeking out how to love one another, by living in hope. Through our care for the weak and vulnerable, by seeking God's favor for those who oppose us, and by uniting in humility. Genuine love also abhors what is evil. But as Paul is going to explain, that doesn't mean simply ignoring what is evil. It's not just driving past the dead skunk. It's overcoming evil. And you overcome evil by good or with good in two different ways. And the first is to pursue peace. Now, it's possible that Paul here is, in fact, it's probable that Paul here is, is shifting focus and talking about those that are outside the church who, who oppose the Christians. But, but notice in verse 18, it says, live peaceably with all. And in the Greek, it's literally with every single person. So even if his focus is on 
those who are outside the church who persecute us for being Christians, it also applies to broken relationships within the church. Verse 18 is a popular verse. If possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. And um, we tend to emphasize the if possible part. Right? We tend to emphasize, um, you know, there are some people that, that just are not interested in living peaceably. And I don't have any responsibilities there because it's just not possible. It's not Paul's emphasis. Paul's emphasis is on so far as it depends on you. So the question is not, have they done what is necessary for, us, for there to be peace? The question is, have you done everything in your power to bring peace in the relationship? Have you had the hard conversation? Have you told someone they've hurt you? Have you said, I have hurt you to another person and apologized and said, I own that? Have you done everything that is possible to be at peace? Most of us stop way, way before we get there. I know I do. Verse 17 actually tells us kind of how to put that in action. If, if someone hurts you, is cruel to you, is mean to you, what you don't do is turn around and respond with the same type of thing. You don't compensate them, give them back. By thinking to yourself, I really want to, to put them in their place, or I really want to give them what they've got coming, or smiling to yourself when something bad happens. But instead, notice again, he's talking about giving thought to, give thought to do what is honorable. In the Greek, the word is good. Give thought, think about, plan how you can do good for that person. And specifically, it's the sort of thing that anyone and everyone would look at and say, this was a response of goodness to this person who has hurt them. And verse 19 tells us why we can do that. Because justice is not in our hands. If we think it's up to us to balance the scales, we will not respond to people desiring their good when they hurt us. But Paul reminds us that justice, vengeance, balancing the scales is in God's hands. And so we can leave it there and say, God, I trust you. This person has hurt me. This person has done evil against me. This person is wrong. But I trust you that you will balance the scales. And that frees me to give thought to what is good and honorable that I can respond to them with. It's really an invitation not to perpetuate the cycle of evil where someone hurts you and you are going to, to show them and pay them back with more evil. It's an invitation to stop the cycle with good. Genuine love overcomes evil with good by pursuing peace, but it does the same thing by pursuing the good of your enemy. To the contrary is, is going back and contrasting that with pursuing vengeance ourselves. He says that's not what we're supposed to do. And then Paul quotes from Proverbs 25. An extremely misunderstood verse. At least it was for me when I was growing up. In Proverbs 25 what he's talking about when he talked about providing food or drink for someone who's hungry or thirsty, it was, it was kind of a, a, an idiom. It was a, a slang word. It was a way of talking, of saying something bigger than just the words themselves. It was a way of saying anything that can be done to meet their needs must be done. Nothing is, nothing is held back. That is, far as, is how far we are to go for our enemies, whatever type of kindness or goodness they need, we will provide. Now, here's the part that I was pretty convinced of most of my life. By doing that to my enemies, boy, would it make them miserable. Let 
do you see what I was really thinking is, if I do that to my enemies, I'm getting revenge? And do you see how that's completely against what Paul's talking about? The reason we misinterpret that passage is because we don't understand the history behind it. In, in ancient cultures, especially about the times that Proverbs would have been written, and especially, this is a big fashion statement in Egypt. Um, it's very popular there. If someone had done something wrong and come to recognize that it was wrong and said, I, I have hurt someone and it was wrong and I repent of that. I turn from that. I, I want to disavow all these things that I have done. What they would do is they would take a bowl and they would fill it with hot coals and they would wear it on their head in public. See, I mean, maybe that hurt, maybe it didn't. That wasn't the point. The point was it was, a, it was a visual public display for everyone to see that this person repented. That's what he's talking about here. This is not about being nice to your enemy so it hurts them. This is about opening the door to repentance. It's opening the door to lead them to recognize what they have done is wrong and then to walk carefully with the Lord. Verse 21 summarizes really this whole passage this morning. When someone wrongs you, you've got a choice. You're either going to perpetuate the cycle of evil or you're going to stop it with good. Thoughts of revenge, of putting someone in their place, of being happy when someone struggles are not genuine love. And we all struggle with those things. And those should be little red flags that say genuine love not at work here. Responding to someone who hurt you by asking God to show them favor. And then doing all you can for their good and to be at peace with them. That is how evil is overcome. The greatest example that you will ever see of this is Jesus on the cross. What does Jesus say on the cross about the people who tortured him, drove the nails into his hands, and the nail into his feet? He looks at them and calls out to his father, Father, forgive them. For they know not what they do. Let's not stop there. What put Jesus on the cross? Wasn't it our evil? And what was his response to our evil? To go to the cross. To sacrifice himself out of love and compassion. That we might be in right relationship with the heavenly father. And as followers of Jesus, we must be like him in responding to the evil in our lives with compassion. And here's the question you have to wrestle with. Where is it right now in your life that you feel like you have been wronged by someone? Who has done evil to you? And then you've got to follow up that question with what does it mean to be like Jesus in that situation? How do you pursue peace and compassion? Genuine love treasures what is good and it hates what is evil. And Paul is not talking about some vague good and evil in our culture. He is talking about the relationships that we live in every single day. He is talking about what goes on in our hearts. And that's the key principle that I want to pull out of this passage and challenge us with. Do not tolerate spiritually lukewarm relationships. Spiritually lukewarm relationships are relationships where we don't really care very much about the evil that happens within them. And we are very passive about the good that happens for the other person. Genuine love calls us to be repulsed by so many things that we shrug off as no big deal. Things like lies and gossip and cruelty and lack of compassion and mean-spiritedness. Genuine love requires that we actively pursue good in our relationships, that we take initiative, 
Verse 11 said that we are to be fervent on fire. We're to be fervent on fire for things like, like loving one another as family, living in hope, caring for the weakest, blessing our opposition, pursuing unity by pursuing humility, pursuing peace, and pursuing the good of our enemy. I want to share with you a tool. Um, and I will make this available online, but I actually think it's more effective if you do this for yourself. It's a tool that I'd encourage you to have with you in your Bible every time you study your Bible. And it's a list of relationships. The top of the list is the Lord because every other relationship that comes that we have in our lives is fundamentally dependent upon how we relate to the Lord. And that gets passed through how we relate to ourselves. Are we taking care of ourselves spiritually? But within that, think about how do you not tolerate spiritual lukewarm relationships? Or in other words, how do you pursue the good of others and, and hate evil in your marriage, with your parents, with your children, with your siblings, with your extended family, with your close relationships within Christian community, the relationships that are helping you grow and holding you accountable, with the church as a whole, with the spiritual authorities that God has put in your life? With the authorities that are over you at work or at school, with your classmates or your co-workers, with the people who work for you, with the vendors that you interact with, with the customers that you interact with. How do you pursue good and hate evil in your relationship with your neighbors, with your friends? Yes, with your enemies. With the casual encounters that you have throughout your week, with, with wait staff, with cashiers, with the person who cuts your hair if you have it. How do you hate evil and cling to good in your relationship with local government authorities, with the broader neighborhood, with the city that you work in, the county that you live in? How do you hate what is evil and pursue what is good with larger authorities, national authorities, with the broader culture, with the nation as a whole, with the world that desperately needs Christ, and even with creation. Don't try to answer that question for all of them. But as you work through it, pick one. Say, you know what? I've got a neighbor that I've got a broken relationship with. How do I pursue what is good and hate what is evil? I've got a person in this church I'm not close to. They're just part of the church. But I need to pursue what is good and hate what is evil in that relationship. Pick one. Pick one. What is Paul doing in these verses? He is challenging the church to live out God's grace with one another by overcoming evil with good. And that will promote a church living in harmony with one another and loving those who hate the church. And that is going to impact our world. And that's what genuine love does for one another and does for a world that desperately needs Christ. Paul's point in this passage, all these bullet points comes down to genuine love clings to what is good and overcomes evil. And the implication for that is that we must be proactive in our genuine love. We cannot be passive or lukewarm in our relationships. We must be proactive. Rodney King asked an extremely important question that is every bit as relevant today as it was in 1992. Why can't we all just get along? And the answer to that question is the same for our society, for our churches, for our cities, for our neighborhoods, and for our families. The answer to that question is that there is a profound lack of genuine love. Not in them, in us. There are so few who will proactively seek good and hate evil. As followers of Jesus, we must, through the power of the Holy Spirit, cling to what is good and overcome evil. 
And here are some suggestions for how you can start working on that this week. Rewrite Romans 12, 9 through 21. Challenge you to rewrite Romans. Why do we do that? Do you notice since Romans, since the start of Romans 12, how much Paul has talked about how we think? Because what we do comes out of how we think. And Paul is very interested in transforming how we think as the way that we transform behavior. And getting scripture into us like this is the tool that the Holy Spirit uses to transform how we think. In our fellowship with one another, proactively cling to what is good this week. Who, as you looked at that chart, who on that chart do you look at and say, I, I need to be eager to show my devotion to, to this person. I, I need to stop using that person as my hope. I, I need to care for the needs of, of this person here. Or I need to ask God to be good to that person who, who I thought was against me. And, and I, need to be pl- I need to plan for how to be at peace with this person, pick someone and then move on it this week. Then you look at the the broader world and our mission to impact the broader world for Christ and and, and you say, how do I proactively overcome the evil this week by pursuing peace with this person in the world who has hurt me or pursuing good for this person in the world who has hurt me? And then pray daily this week for the person who opposes you. We all have someone that we feel opposes us. Who is it? Instead of fostering anger and thoughts of revenge, let's pray for God's favor. Why can't we all just get along? Because genuine love is hard. And it requires sacrifice. So we rely on the Holy Spirit to do that work in our lives. Would you join me now, stand, and let's go before the Lord and ask him to do that work? Heavenly Father, we confess to you that we have clung to what is evil and rejected to what is good too often in our lives, too often this past week, maybe too often this morning. Or we have tolerated relationships with each other that ignore evil and do not pursue good. We have cared more about what is convenient and comfortable and easy than what reflects your love and your character to one another and to a world that needs you. And we confess that that is true of us and that is our struggle. And we also stand in awe and thanksgiving that you respond to our struggle the very way this passage talks about. You desire our good, you love us, and you overcome the evil in our lives with your goodness. You pursued us, you overcame our evil on the cross, and you build good into our lives by making us like Jesus. Lord, we ask that you would help us to be people who reflect genuine love, your love, to one another and to a world that needs it. In Jesus' name, amen. So before we go, here is what we said about who God is. God loves you with a genuine love. He is overcoming evil, and he is helping you cling to what is good. So here's our challenge as we leave here. Reflect 